Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. And in this episode, we do the Roman Empire. Its reforms and its glories. The Roman Empire, run by an emperor, lasts about 500 years. Just like the Roman Republic. So the Roman period of time of success is about a thousand years. It lasts from 27 BC, when Octavian defeats Mark Antony and takes over, to 476 AD. Now, technically, that's only in the West. In the East, the Eastern Roman Empire will survive for another thousand years, to 1453. So what are the reforms? When Octavian, who will be later named Augustus, the August one, the great one, takes over, he's got problems. The first is, is that the Senate has been completely demolished. The Senate and the families of the Senate uh, have spent the last hundred years fighting with each other, being murdered by the side that won being exploited, they are basically in no condition to run the show, and Octavian takes over. Now, he doesn't simply just replace the Senate. He keeps the Senate, this, but the Senate is now a rubber stamp. The Senate will do whatever Octavian says. The emperor runs the government, and the idea of that is to provide stability. The last 125 years of the Senate was the murder of the Gracchi, and then civil war, civil war, civil war. It was 125 years of instability. And what Romans wanted was stability. They just wanted it to stop. So he wanted a strong person to just say, enough, I'll run it. This is good if you have a good emperor like Octavian Augustus. This is bad if you have a bad emperor like Caligula or Nero, because it means the emperor is in charge and there's no checks on their power. The army is the emperor's, not Rome's. Remember, we talked about this. Caesar's army remains loyal to Caesar and not to Rome. Well, Octavian uses half of that army. Mark Antony uses the other half of that army. They slaughter each other for a little bit, and then Octavian wins. So his army was his private army. He makes that the army of Rome, but it's loyal to the emperor. It is paid for by the emperor, and that is to buy its loyalty. And what Octavian does is turn it into a professional force. Rather than hiring farmers to do this, rather than having conscription, he is going to have a professional full-time force. They're going to be well-paid. They're going to get a pension after 20 years. The emperor makes sure that the army is loyal. And this army, the army of the empire, is excellent because it's all it's doing is training to fight wars. Three, he changes the who gets into the government. Who's going to run the show? And what he creates is the dynasty. The best jobs stay in the family. Senate families no longer matter. The old Scipios and the such, they don't matter anymore. If you want a good job in the government, if you want to be a general, if you want to be a governor, if you want to be secretary of treasury or something, you have to be within the, the family of the emperor. Married in, be someone's cousin. The old idea of talent that will just find a general that worked in the wars against Hannibal no longer applies. Loyalty is be is better than talent now. It's loyalty over talent. They don't want the best guy for the job. They want the most loyal person for the job. And that brings us to welfare. Welfare continues. But welfare is different from free food and entertainment. That obviously didn't work. So what welfare is going to be is jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Infrastructure. Jobs for poor Romans. Emperors are going to build big things, but unlike pyramids and unlike the great library in Assyria, 
unlike the Great Wall of China, the Roman still has that mentality of a republic. And so they're going to build big things that all people can use. Aqueducts that are going to bring water, like rivers in the sky. They're going to be water to your cities. Roads so that you can go from place to place. You could travel. You could trade. Baths so that the Romans are clean people. In fact, um, get rid of a lot of diseases this way. They are our first truly clean people. They have giant, I mean, take Rome. There's the Circus Maximus, which is the horse racing, the chariot race. There's the Colosseum, which are which is the um, gladiatorial event. And then the third biggest building was the Diocletian Baths. And you could go see them today. The Diocletian Baths is still there. And that was for the public. You, you, pay, you went, you paid a little bit of money. It was subsidized for the most part by the, by the emperor. And you paid a little bit of money just to offset some of the cost. And then you had all of this stuff. And the bath wasn't just like a tub, though that was that. They had the steam rooms. They had prostitutes. They had meeting rooms. It's, it's like a WeWork place and a gym combined. It was a whole, you went for the whole day. You could do your business. You could relax. You can eat. It was a whole thing. It was a club, but a club for everybody. So emperors build big things that people can use. The Colosseum, the circus, which means circle, the, the baths, the aqueducts. They also brought the Pax Romana. Good emperors bring peace. Now, this is very different from the Republic. The Republic was about war. But the empire is more or less going to stop expanding. They're going to create borders on the Danube River. After an attempt to conquer Germany, it's going to pull back to the Rhine. They're going to be defeated in 9 AD at Tudenberg Forest. And Augustus is going to say, okay, enough. And he's going to put his army, instead of invading other places, he's going to put him on borders so that the army isn't for offensive war anymore. It's border patrol, a defense in depth. So the idea is to create security in Italy, in Spain, in southern France, in the core regions of, of the Roman Empire, which may have no army men whatsoever, but instead push the troops out onto the, out onto the edges of the world. So the empire stops expanding. The army is going to be used for defensive purposes for the most part, rather than offensive purposes. Now, this there are a couple of exceptions to that. There's the invasion of Dacia, uh, Dacia which is uh, Romania um, above the Danube. There's the invasion in Mesopotamia against the Parthians. Um, but for the most part, the empire lives in peace. And even if there's war on the borders... There's not war internally. No one in the empire fights anymore. And that is huge because that is an entire redefinition of masculinity. Remember what we talked about. Remember the Greeks. Remember the Spartans. Remember the Assyrians. People fought all the time. Men fought every year. Remember New Kingdom Egypt. New, they got together and they fought all the time, their neighbors. Men farmed and fought. That's what they did. Now they don't do that anymore. The Romans keep the peace. The Romans go to towns and say, you can't fight your neighbor anymore. You can't fight the people across the mountain. We keep the peace. So now masculinity has to be redefined. Because, yeah, you could try to join the Roman army, and people will. But the Roman army was 200,000 troops. Which is big. But it's an empire of 20 million. It's not that big. Most people who want to join the army can't. And so they have to find a new way to define their masculinity. Whereas in the masculinity of Roman Republic, Virtus, right? Dignitas was in war. Now it's not. And what happens is education and economics go up. 
they invest in their future. Why? Well, now they have one. Before, you didn't know if you had a future. Why? Well, because if I go off to war in summer, in June, and I get killed, why would I have invested in a business that wasn't going to pay, pay off for 10 years? Like there, you don't know if you have a future if you're at war all the time. So there's no reason to get an education. You don't know if you'll ever use it. There's no reason to, to invest by property. You might as well just spend the money and have fun with it. And so what happens now is now you have a future. You're not going to go to war this summer or next summer. So what are you going to do with that time? And what people do is invest in the future. They invest in education for boys especially, but also elite girls, noble girls get education as well. Economics goes up as people start to invest in businesses that have a long-term future. So you get this investment that had never happened before. What about the culture of the empire? Well, we get several writers. We get Plutarch and Tacitus as some of our great academic writers. Plutarch does biography, but he's not just writing lives. And his book is called The Lives, but it's morality. It's he compares great Greeks to great Romans. And the idea is, how should you live a good life? Well, look at these great Greeks. Look at these great Romans who he puts together He com to compare, to show off one aspect of morality, of ethics, of how to live. And Plutarch has the best stories. He's got, he's got witty conversation. He would be great at a dinner party. Tacitus, on the other hand, invents what essentially we would call sociology. Who are the people of the empire? And who are the people outside of the empire? How do they live? What do they think about? What do they want? What do they believe in? That's his book called the Germania. His analysis of Germany, of the Germans. And this is what we do in sociology. In sociology, we study the cultures of people. What makes people people? Not biologically, but culturally. And that's what Tacitus is doing. It's different than history. He's not writing down the events, the histories of German tribes. He says, oh, this tribe fights this tribe and this tribe fights this tribe. But he also goes into their religion. They're sacrificing. They're gods. They're, they're what their clothes they wear, what they drink. Because the idea is all of those things tell you about them. Now, these are people outside of the empire. And he does this in order to critique Romans. He asks the question, is the Roman project the best one? Are Romans living the best life? Could we be better? Remember our platonic idea. Who is more free, more brave, more honorable, us or the barbarians? Because if it's the answer is the barbarians, then what are we doing wrong? We're supposed to be the greatest people in the whole wide world. In some ways, this is what Rousseau does. This is a very typical Western um, argumentative method that you take your enemy and you show off all the great things about your enemy and you say, look, our enemy is better than us. How, if our enemy is better than us, what, why do we think we're so great? Horace. Horace is the great poet. Now, Horace fought in the Civil Wars and actually was in the army of Mark Antony against Octavian. But he was a regular common soldier, and so he's going to survive the war. He's going to write odes and satires, and his is the examination of ordinary life. Basically, it's Greek poetry with farts in it. It's Greek poetry for ordinary people, the odes and the satires. And it allows him for comedy. See, even at this point, Greek poetry is, about, oh, it's so wonderful. It's Greek drama. Oh. And what Horace does is bring it down to the people. Allows for comedy, for self-reflection, farts, death, sex. 
Carpe diem. Rejoice while you are alive. Enjoy the day. Live life to the fullest. Make the most of what you have. It is later than you think. You're going to die soon. Like, whoops. That's Horace. Horace is the stand-up comic, but he does it in poetry. He's not... But he's, a, he's reflecting the world of ordinary people back to people, but using the style, the elevated style of the Greeks. Uh, in some ways, it's like Hamilton, the Hamilton musical. The Hamilton musical is about, is a Broadway show, so it's an elite form of art. Using the Broadway show methodology of dancing, of singing, of choruses, of costumes. To talk about elite American men, to do American history, elite American history. Jefferson, Burr, Madison, Hamilton. But how does Lin-Manuel Miranda do it? He uses rock. He uses rap. He uses the style of the New York streets. He does the style, the ordinary musical style of the people he listened to when he grew up. So even though everything else about it is elevated, the mode is something ordinary people have experience with. And that's Horace. The ability to use Greek poetry as the style, but then you talk about the ordinary parts of life. That brings us to Virgil. Virgil writes the Aeneid, and that is his remix of Homer. See, Rome is war all the time. It doesn't have those great poets. It doesn't have a a a Homer. It has a Cincinnatus. It's got great generals, but it doesn't have a Homer. A guy so well respected in his poetry, an Aeschylus, a Sophocles. Rome doesn't have it. They're remember, they're not sophisticated. So they had to import this stuff. And so what Virgil does is re remix Homer. And in doing Homer, in remixing Homer, he creates that Rome is descended from the great heroes of Troy. See, he, he he basically gives Rome an origin story. See, we're great. We are great people. Look, we even have a great... And if you have a great... If you're great people, you need a great poetry. Like the Greeks have. Remember, in the Middle Middle East, it was cities. You had to have a great city to be respected. For the Romans, you had to have a great origin story. You had to have a Homer. And Virgil will do that. Virgil is so important as a great writer that when Dante, a thousand years later writes his comedy, Commedia, he's not a comedy, it's the Commedia, his Inferno, his Purgatorio, his Paradiso, he has Virgil, of all the people, of all the writers, pop up to help guide him through hell. So Virgil gets the respect of being the Roman great poet. And what he does is tell this story that Aeneas escapes the fall of Troy, go, has an odyssey, goes on an adventure, ends up in a small little town called Carthage that he helps found with a smoking hot queen. Then leaves, goes to a small little village on the Tiber River called that will be called Rome. And what does this do? It does a couple things. One, it gives Rome an origin story. Two, it relates Rome to Carthage. Now, here we are. Around the time of Jesus, right? Carthage was destroyed 150 years before. And they're still obsessed with Carthage. Why did Carthage come so close to defeating us? Oh, what is Virgil's answer? We're related. We're cousins. That's why. Of course we come of course they came close to defeating us. We're related to each other. We're both great people. 
two. Rome is the avenger of Greece. See, the Greeks get to tell the story that they destroyed Troy. And they're like, we won, we won, we won. We're so great, we're so great. Well, who conquered the Greeks? Rome. Mic drop. And so if the Romans are related to the Trojans, which they're not, but the story is that they are, the Romans can now say that the Trojans won because the Romans are the new Trojans who conquered Greece. And take that, Greeks. Booyah! And it's a cool little story. It makes you feel good if you're Roman. We defeated those Greeks. They're not so tough. They're not so great. We got the last laugh. And what is the point of all this? Rome needs epic poetry. An origin story. Virgil will tell the story of the Trojan horse. It's alluded to. It's not in the Iliad at all. It is alluded to in the Odyssey. It is Virgil who tells the story of the Trojan horse. And he comes up with the phrase, beware gif- Greeks bearing gifts. Timio Danaos et Dona Frientes. Beware Greeks bearing gifts. Which was very true at the time. Both the Trojan horse and Greek lawyers. Remember, the Greeks loved the debate. Remember, the Greeks are legalistic down to like the period in contracts. So Roman governors are dealing with Greeks and like, oh my God, we want to rip out our eyes. Can we just, can I go, can I go to Gaul and fight Gauls? I just want to fight somebody. I can't take this, these lawsuits, these Greek lawsuits. And it's beware Greeks bearing gifts. And that comes from Virgil. Finally, we have Marcus Aurelius, an emperor of Rome, the last of the good emperors, the last of the great emperors in 180 AD. He writes a book, Meditations. It's a book on how to be a good man. It's technically supposed to be for his son. His son probably never read it, and his son goes freaking nuts. Um, Commodius goes insane and, um, you know, starts the destruction of the Roman Empire. But he writes this book, Meditations. And the idea is how to be a good ruler, how to be a good man, how to be a good Roman, but how to be a good leader. And it's, it's, he's a stoic, I want to say, I'm pretty sure he's, it's a bit of stoicism. But you have quotes like, you have power over your mind, not events. Like, this is very mindfulness. Be, control what you can control. Be concerned what you can control. You can, I cannot control what happens to me, but I can tr- control my reaction to what happens to me. Every psychologist, go to the psych 101 classes. They will tell you that. And that's Marcus Aurelius right there. 2,000 years before psychology. You have the power over your mind, how you think and react to something, but not events. Man shouldn't fear death, but not living. So the idea is you only have a limited amount of time on earth. Do something with it. Don't worry about death. It happens to us all. It's going to happen. Worrying about death can paralyze you. Whereas you shouldn't worry about it. You should just live. Do get something done with your life. A man who looked at what ought to be done, not to the reputation which it is got by a man's acts. The idea of responsibility. You do what you have to do, not what you get out of it. Would it be great if you did something and everyone appreciated you? Um, this is being a man. This is being a husband, a wife, a father, a mother. Will you Are you supposed to take care of your kids? Yeah. You know, does anyone go, woo, yeah, you're, you're, you took care of your kids. No, you just do it because that's what you're supposed to do. You take out the garbage. You go to work. No one, you don't get a parade for it. You just do it. What is the point of all these these quotes? It's that Greek philosophy being applied to the Roman political class. 
It's how much the Romans are absorbing Greek ideas. And from the Roman elite, it goes through the Roman population. Because Romans, Roman citizens, want to live like the Roman emperors. If a Roman emperor acts a certain way, Roman citizens say, well, I want to act that way. This is very true of kingdoms. So the good life equals one of fulfillment, of activity, and of dignity, of doing the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. To not sit and be, and this is very true of the rich, to not be the idle rich, to not sit on your money. You have to do something with it. You have to act. Remember Homer? Action versus passive. That's the Romans absorb that. Fulfillment is in the activities you do, in the dignity that you have. You do what you need to do. And this is very much the idea of the good life. It's not having money. It's not being wealthy. There are plenty of stories of where the poor man is actually happier than the rich man, more fulfilled. But it's the idea of, of what Buddha will talk about in the, the Eightfold Path, of the right mind, the right action. Problems with the Roman Empire? Yeah. If you get bad emperors, you get problems. Caligula, Nero, Commodius. Too much power in bad hands equals disaster. Now, the problems of Caligula and Nero, the Roman Empire could, could survive and stabilize itself. Starting after with Commodius, increasingly the Roman Empire is unable to fix itself, to right that ship. It keeps coming close and then falls back into dis disrepair. Two, there's no rule on how to make a successor. The emperor is not a king. They're just generals. Like emperor, imperator means general with a victory. That's all it means. It's, it's just a title. It's a meaningless title. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, um, sophorific, I think is the word. It's like saying Mr. or calling me doctor. Like, it's nice that you call me doctor. It doesn't change who I am. It doesn't mean anything. Like, not calling me doctor doesn't change my essential nature. An emperor, a Roman emperor, can't hand power down to anybody. Since an emperor has to be a general, the emperor has to be a man, an adult man, capable of running the army with charisma. That could get the Senate to go along with whatever they want and to get the army to follow them. Now, being related to the previous emperor is a help. But there's no rule that it has to be a son. It has to be a brother. It has to be even the same family. And so there's always a question of who's next. For the first 200 years, more or less, there's a stability. There's one civil war after the death of Nero. It's a quick one. And then things stabilize for a while. But after 180, after Commodius dies, you go through revolution after revolution after revolution and disaster. Because all you need is an adult man with charisma. And there are plenty out there. The third problem is there are enemies outside the borders. Because the Roman Empire will not expand, will stop expanding, there are the Germans in the north, the Goths in the northeast, and the Persians in the east. What does this mean? It means you need an army on the borders. You are not going to conquer these people. You are not going to absorb them. So you need to always defend the borders with a good army, which means you always need money. The Roman army is expensive. Whether it's used or not, you have to pay those troops. And what you get is this ongoing peace in the core of the empire, but war on the frontiers. Most people don't see the, the dangers, and they dislike paying taxes for it. You can say, oh, we're protecting you from the bad guys, and they're like, yeah, 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 which, who, who? 
I'm in Spain. I'm a thousand miles away from Germany. Why am I paying a tax to support the army in Germany? Like, what the, let the people near them pay the tax. And so there's a dislike for the costs of this. And emperors have to find the money. There's, there's, there's not a lot of, like, credit. There's, there is credit in the world, but not like the way we have credit. They can't just um, print bonds and be done with it the way, say, the British bank does or, say, the Federal Reserve does. They needed to have the cash. And so there's always this problem of what they, what, how to pay for that army. And that army has to be in the north to fight the Germans, in the northeast to fight the Goths, and in the east to fight the Persians. And every once in a while, every couple of years, you'll have an invasion from the Germans, Goths, or Persians that you have to deal with. What we will do next in our next lecture will be the collapse of the Roman Empire. What happens? And that's where we will leave off. That's our next question. All right. Well, good luck. I'll talk to you later. Bye.